Thank you, Steve, and good morning. It's uh, good to be in Chicago. It's one of my favorite uh, towns, certainly my favorite town to do business in. And I had a nice hearty welcome when I saw in the pit over there uh, across the street three Lincoln welding machines. So it made my day uh, uh, start off on the right footing. Uh, it helps me, it helps uh, Dr. Kulak, who will be doing the bolting session, if we have a little understanding of our audience and, and where you're coming from. So if you will, uh, if you indicate uh, your profession, how many of you are engineers designing uh, buildings, bridges? All right, good. How many are in the contracting business? All right, a few of you. Uh, inspectors? One, two, okay. Uh, educators? All right, couple. Anybody else that I left out? Yes, sir. Software company. All right, good, good. Uh, well, I, we're, we're glad to have the group here, obviously heavily concentrated on engineering, and, and that's the thrust of the program. I trust there will be something here uh, for everyone. The seminar, as uh, Steve has indicated, is addressing the two major ways that we join steel today, uh, welding and bolting. And I have the opportunity to do the session this morning and I have the most interesting of the two topics to address. Uh, it would be very polite of you if you would come to hear Dr. Kulak, despite the subject matter that he has to, to speak on. Actually, Dr. Kulak does a great job. Uh, here's the general outline of what we're going to be covering this morning. I'll have an introduction to welding processes. Some of you might say, why are you going to do that? First, we're going to do it very quickly, but secondly, we've done this program all across the country. Based upon feedback we've received already, based upon the questions we get asked, this program has been modified and honed and hopefully improved. And I think that the background of welding processes will be helpful to those who may have a limited understanding of that. Then we'll get into uh, introduction to welding connections where we're going to go through joints, uh, weld types, uh, selection of welds for different details. Unfortunately, that's the basics. Uh, and it tends to be uh, less exciting than other portions, but we need to get the basics in. Uh, then we're going to go into um, uh, determining weld size. We'll do that very quickly. Uh, we'll move through principles of design, which I hope is, is uh, uh, as intriguing to you as it has been to other audiences. I trust you'll have many ideas that you'll take away from that that will be very helpful. Uh, the final or the next subject is distortion, how to limit distortion in welding, Many things that the designer can do to help minimize distortion. So we'll have a special emphasis on distortion control from a uh, design perspective. As time permits, we'll go through some cost reduction ideas. If this program's like others, we aren't going to get through the cost reduction ideas. Sometimes we don't even get started. I always come more prepared uh, because I don't like to stand up here uh, and suck air uh, of not having anything to say. So we've given you more material than, than I can cover and I'm previewing the fact we may not get through all of them. Our program today is going to be uh, largely a condensation of materials that are contained in codes and specifications that you've been referencing for years. And of course, you know that 2005 was a very big year uh, in the area of specifications where the AISC brought out the first joint ASD LRFD specification in 2005. There are welding related provisions in AISC and I will be making reference to those throughout the morning. We're also going to be relying heavily on D1.1. D1.1 is invoked by AISC uh, specs by reference and so your projects governed by uh, AISC are automatically governed by, uh, are, are already are covered by D1.1, the structural welding code for steel. There are other D1 documents that may be of interest to you. One of those is the Sheet Steel Code D1.3. This was designed specifically to give a standard for welding sheet metal decking onto supporting steel. It can also be used uh, for structures made of sheet steel less than 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. D1.1 is designed for 1 8 inch and thicker. D1.3 for 3 16ths and less. The overlap is deliberate. 
The idea is that if you have primarily heavier material, you specify D1.1. If you have primarily thinner material, you can specify D1.3. How many of you are involved with bridge work? I can see a show of hands. Well, that's quite a few. That's quite a few. Uh, D1.5 is the joint AWS AASHTO welding specification for steel bridges. And this code, uh, I believe the 2002 version is the latest. It covers redundant bridges. It also covers uh, uh, non-redundant applications for fracture critical uh, situations. Uh, this is designed for highway bridges. How many of you are involved with railway bridges? Okay, a few. Uh, ARIMA uh, largely uh, cites D1.5 and takes a couple of exceptions or modifications to D1.5. So if you're involved with uh, railroad bridges, uh, D1.5 would also be an applicable specification. A relatively new offering in the portfolio of D1 codes is D1.6, the Structural Welding Code for Stainless Steels. So if you have a, a structure uh, that is made of stainless steel, whether ferritic, austenitic, martensitic, uh, duplex stainlesses, precipitation hard hardened stainless steels, uh, they are all governed uh, by D1.6. And this is a much more straightforward way to ensure uh, quality in your project to cite D1.6 rather than try to amend uh, D1.1 to cover those applications. And the latest offering, at least in terms of printing, would be D1.8, the Seismic Welding Supplement. Since the 1994 Northridge earthquake, the structural steel industry has been uh, undergoing a whole variety of modifications to specifications based upon what we learned from that seismic event. And so we've had a series of supplements, the AISC seismic specifications, as well as new issuances of the uh, uh, seismic spec. And on the AWS side, uh, D1.8 was uh, officially approved in 2005, uh, was first printed uh, this year, and is now, now available. D1.8 is indeed a supplement to D1.1. So we start with D1.1, and D1.8 sets on top of that. It incorporates many of the principles that were uh, recommended from the FEMA documents uh, that were based upon the uh, investigations that followed the uh, 94 Northridge earthquake. One of those documents was FEMA 353. And this became the default standard for many uh, people until these other consensus standards have, uh, have been developed. These were guidelines, not specification requirements per se. And one of the uh, implementation problems with uh, FEMA 353 was that it required a variety of decisions to be made. And too, all too often, people were specifying in their uh, contract documents comply with, the, uh, with uh, FEMA 353. Well, again, there were a lot of options in FEMA 353 that involved more inv required more involvement of the engineer than simply a citation of three, FEMA 353. So these principles have now gone through the consensus process. Uh, and many of them incorporated into AWS D1.8, and then, of course, many of them in the AISC seismic specifications. If you're not aware of that, that was uh, recently, uh, well, 2005. Uh, is the latest issue of the seismic provisions. There's also another relatively new document, also 2005, and that is the AISC Connection Prequalification document, or often called CPRP for the Committee Connection Prequalification and Review Panel. You may be familiar with the fact that after the 94 Northridge earthquake, the prequalified status of what we now call the pre-Northridge connection uh, was withdrawn and connections needed to be tested with full-scale tests. And the AISC seismic provisions have an annex that prescribes how those uh, tests are to be performed. Uh, the same seismic specifications uh, give us al alternatives uh, of a pre-qualification uh, process and the document that you see on the screen is now the first um, uh, issuance of that document. 
that gives pre-qualified status to the reduced beam section or dog bone connection and also to the bolted in plate connection. In future editions, it's hoped that this offering will be extended to other connection details. The seismic provisions and the CPRP will be bound or have been bound into a single document and called the seismic manual available with a hardcover from AISC. And if you're unaware of this, the AISC specifications, the seismic specifications, and the connection pre-qualification document are all available for a free download from the AISC website. So if you want to get that material, you can do that at no cost, available to anyone. The content of this program this morning has been largely captured in a soon-to-be-published design guide, Design Guide 21 from AISC, and it has the title, Welded Connections, a Primer for Engineers. Several years ago, AISC asked me to write this. It's been several years in the development, but it started with the outline of this lecture, and then it grew. And one of the greatest values in this design guide came when the AISC Solution Center submitted a list of welding-related questions that they receive on an ongoing basis and asked to make sure that this design guide covered those issues. Unfortunately, that expanded the volume of work I needed to do, but it also enhanced the value. And so setting aside the pride of authorship, I encourage you to take a look at this, and I believe that members of AISC can download that document for free, and you can buy it with a cover from the Institute. There's a corollary document that Dr. Kulak wrote on bolts, and so now you have a compendium of the two that you can use for these programs, to understand these programs. I noticed that several of you, many of you, are flipping through your pages of your manuals. That's fine by me. I have 700 images I'm going to go through, or could go through, and you can keep doing that. You've got every one. I think the education is best if you get the concept down from the screen and continue on, but you can do anything you want. Let's get into the first lecture, and it says arc welding processes. The first thing I want to discuss is the difference between fusion and penetration. In welding, we always need fusion. Fusion is that molecular bonding between the material we call weld metal and the material we call the base metal or the steel we're joining. We always need fusion. Penetration is when the arc, the energy of the arc, has dug into the base material, melted part of that, and then the weld solidified thereafter. Penetration is desirable. It's not always necessary, but fusion is always necessary. Allow me to use an, an example. Uh, most of us are familiar, most of you are familiar with uh, soldering of perhaps uh, uh, copper pipe. When my dad taught me how to solder pipe, he said, uh, you clean the inside of the fittings as clean as you can. And you clean the outside of the fitting as clean as you can, and then you put on flux. You put the two together, and you heat one side of the fitting, and you add in the filler or the solder from the opposite side. And when it melts and sucks around there with capillary action, uh, you've got a good uh, soldered connection. We're going to go back to that in just a moment, but how much penetration does the solder into the copper have? Zero. But we have a bond. And some could argue it's a weld, and I don't want to get into those semantics. But the point of it is we have fusion in the absence of penetration. We always need fusion. Now, how do we get fusion? Two requirements for fusion. We need atomic closeness, and we need atomic cleanliness. Let's start with cleanliness. Why did my dad tell me to clean the inside of the fitting and clean the outside of the fitting or outside of the pipe as clean as I could get? Because what he knew is, and what you know is, if you don't get cleanliness, you're not going to get a good bond. You see, atoms, metallic atoms, have a desire to connect with another metallic atom. 
But if that metallic atom instead combines with an oxygen atom, it forms an oxide, and the oxide neutralizes the attractive force that's naturally present in a pure metallic surface. So we need to get off that oxide so we can liberate, if you will, the attractive forces that want to join the two materials together. And in every one of our welding processes, in every one of our brazing processes, in every one of our soldering processes, we have some activity that goes to the issue of obtaining cleanliness in the system. Atomic closeness, what do we mean by that? If I bring in two steel surfaces and sit them on top of each other, even if they're real clean, you know they don't weld together. Why? Because on an atomic scale, the atoms of one surface and another surface are a great distance away. We need to get them as close to each other as we can. Going back to our copper water pipe and our soldering application, how do we obtain closeness in that situation? We put in a liquid, and the liquid was attracted to the surface by capillary action. And now we have a liquid on top of a solid, and we have a close proximity between the metallic atoms that's going to encourage this bonding to take place. That's the same way as in arc welding. We apply liquid met uh, metal into the joint that flows between the materials in order to obtain atomic closeness. Two requirements for welding, atomic closeness, atomic cleanliness. Notice the list doesn't include heat, does it? Some welding processes, not what I'm going to talk about today, some welding processes don't involve heat. Some welding processes simply involve force that pushes the atoms close enough together. Now, that's not what we use in construction. That's not what we're going to talk about today. But it's another way of obtaining atomic closeness. Once we create a liquid pool of metal, and that's what we do in arc welding, once we have a liquid pool of metal, we need to protect that metal from the atmosphere. Now, in general terms, our air is composed of about 80% nitrogen, 19% oxygen, and the last 1% makes up all the other gases. It turns out that nitrogen is very detrimental to liquid metal, and oxygen is not particularly good. So we need to protect the molten pool from the atmosphere. And when I'm down south, they all understand this illustration. I've got to be careful. This has been videotaped, isn't it? Somebody down south might hear this. I respect the people from the South. My wife is from Texas, so I got to be careful. Um, but when I go down South and I order iced tea, they always say sweetened or unsweetened. And <clears throat> I say unsweetened and I put in my sweetener. But the way they make sweetened tea is while it's hot, they pour in as much sugar as they can get. And why do they dissolve the sugar in it when it's hot? Because the solubility of sugar in hot tea is greater than the solubility of sugar in cold tea. Well, perhaps the illustration is not necessary, but the solubility of nitrogen in liquid metal when it's hot is very, very great. Now, when that molten metal filled with nitrogen starts to cool and solidify, the solubility of nitrogen drops way down. And so this gas that's dissolved in the liquid congeals into bubbles, and the bubbles of gas start to percolate out. And that happens just as the weld metal is solidifying, it leaves holes behind. We call those holes porosity. Some nitrogen's left behind in the weld metal. That embrittles the weld metal. So we need to protect the liquid metal from nitrogen. Oxygen causes certain elements in the molten pool to oxidize, and it depends on their oxidation potential, but uh, various elements like chromium and, um, and others will oxidize. They form part of the slag system, and that alloy is no longer in the weld metal to perform the function that the designer intended uh, when the electrode was uh, conceived. So we need to protect the liquid puddle and the arc from oxygen as well. There are two ways we do that. We use slags or we use gases. Slags are ceramic kinds of compounds that are formed when fluxes melt 
uh, in the in the ark. And the slag acts like a mechanical lid uh, on the molten puddle. So we have the molten puddle, but on top of that we have this lid, and the lid protects uh, the puddle, the molten pool, from the atmosphere <coughs> and keeps oxygen and nitrogen uh, from harming it. The other way we may do it is with gases. And if we put an inert gas in and around the arc, it displaces the air, it displaces the oxygen, the nitrogen, and that gives us an inert environment in which the weld metal can solidify and cool. As soon as the metal is solidified, the solubility, the desirability of combining with oxygen and nitrogen is gone, and we don't need to worry about it anymore. You say, well, I thought we were going to talk about welding processes. Well, these are the fundamentals of welding, and now we're going to review the processes, and I want you to think about how is shielding accomplished, how is metal delivered to the joint, uh, how is the molten pool protected from oxygen and nitrogen? For structural steel, we have four welding processes that are commonly used. I'm going to discuss five of them. The American Welding Society has acronyms for each one of these processes. Shielded metal arc welding, flux cord arc welding, gas metal arc welding, submerged arc welding, and then we will also talk about gas tungsten arc welding. Let's start with shielded metal arc welding. This is the arc welding process with which most people are familiar. It's the 12 or 14 inch long sparkler, if you will, that's coated with flux. There's a core wire. Uh, the core wire varies in diameter, but typically an eighth of an inch to about three sixteenths of an inch. A perf perf carefully prepared uh, chemical coating on the outside uh, is applied to the material. And when the electrical energy is passed through that core wire, an arc is struck against the base material. The arc is estimated to be six to 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Steel's melting in at around 2,000 degrees, excuse me, 3,000 degrees. So it's more than ample energy to melt both the filler metal, the flux, and the base metal. From the core wire of the electrode, uh, the metal melts. That becomes part of the weld. The arc melts part of the base material. That would be what we would be calling the penetration. And then the flux coating is what becomes a slag that shows up on the top of the weld. One of the advantages of shielded metal arc welding is that it's very simple. You can see that the limited amount of equipment needs to be supplied to the operator, uh, and it allows the operator to get in and make welds in areas where more complicated equipment would make it restrictive. As we talk about arc welding, we always want to remember safety. The welder has certain kinds of safety equipment that he or she must uh, use, a face shield that guards against the uh, intense arc, the ultraviolet rays, rays uh, protects against uh, sparks, uh, protective uh, clothing uh, to protect against uh, uh, the uh, arc sparks. Uh, we need to supply adequate ventilation for the welder so that uh, the welding fumes can be avoided uh, and other issues. If you're involved with safety of welders, please know that the American Welding Society has all kinds of welding data uh, and health and safety data on their website including a, a series of fact sheets that address all the major hazards associated with welding and precautions that need to be taken. To power the arc, we have a, a welding power supply. It takes the relatively low voltage and high, excuse me, it takes the relatively high voltage and low amperage that comes out of our walls and converts it into high amperage, low voltage. Additionally, it may take the AC power that comes in and convert it to DC or direct current for a more stable arc. So that's the function of these power supplies. This is a small one that you might have in your home or in your garage. You can get those at Home Depot or Lowe's, get the red ones, they're the good ones. And uh, 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 so you can get one of those. And every family, every home should have one. Uh, <laughs> of course, that makes for a very simple system. Uh, two leads that come out, one goes to the work, and the other one goes to the electrode. The American Welding Society has a series of filler metal specifications uh, that govern the uh, properties of the electrodes. It's very analogous to ASTM and steel properties. 
The E stands for electrode. The 70, 70, is very important to us who design uh, connections because that is the minimum specified tensile strength of the deposited metal. Later on, we're going to find that we use 30% of that, uh, or 21 KSI, for the allowable uh, shear strength on our fillet welds. The one is important to the welder. It tells the welder that this electrode can be used in all positions. A two for this particular product would indicate that it's uh, for flat and horizontal position only. Not too important to the designer. Buried in the eight is a whole variety of information. It tells the uh, welder what kind of coating it has, whether it's not, uh, whether it's low hydrogen or not low hydrogen. It tells uh, the welder what polarity uh, uh, and type of current is available. But also important to designers, it tells us about the Sharpie V-notch impact toughness. And it's my business, so I've memorized all of them. Uh, you probably won't memorize them, so you have to look them up. Uh, the uh, design guide has some helpful information in that regard. And later on in the session, I'll give you some websites that can help you with that information as well. One of the restrictions with shield metal arc welding is after I burn down that 12 or 14 inch long uh, electrode, I need to stop, throw out the remaining uh, stub, put in a new electrode, uh, chip off the slag <coughs> from the finish of the previous weld, restrike, and get started again. And that's basically building in an interruption into the work. For years, it was desirable then to come up with a way to make the electrode continuous, if you will, so the welder could weld as long as he or she wanted to. Well, one of the processes that overcame that restriction is flux cord arc welding. And flux cord arc welding basically took that stick electrode and turned it inside out. Instead of the flux being on the outside of a steel electrode, now the flux is inside a tube that's made of steel. So this is, uh, if the stick electrode is a corn dog, then this is a pixie stick. Remember pixie sticks? Okay, straw with the powders inside, right? And so that's uh, flux cord arc welding. Now we can put it onto a spool. We say it's a continuous electrode. Obviously, it has a finite length eventually. But the spool may be a pound of wire. More commonly, it's 30 pounds or 60 pounds of wire. But we can also put a, a barrel of wire out there. It might have 1,000 pounds. And that allows somebody to weld as long as they want. There are two distinct variations within uh, the process of flux cord arc welding, gas shielded and self shielded flux core. Now this picture illustrates gas shielded electrode, which uh, flux core, which is often abbreviated with a dash G in the uh, uh, acronym. With this particular process, the cord electrode is fed through a gun and cable assembly. I'll show you that in a moment. Shielding gas is also pumped in through a tube, and that shielding gas displaces the atmosphere of the uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen that we need to protect the weld metal against. The electrical power is delivered to the wire through a copper device called a contact tip, and then the 8,000 degree arc is formed, the slag is formed out of the flux that's in the center of the wire, and the process continues. The gun that I said I would mention is uh, held in the operator's hand. There's a trigger on the gun, and in most cases, the trigger, uh, when pulled, will cause the mechanical wire feeders to start feeding the wire through the system. It also turns on the power supply and energizes the gun. And if it's gas shielded flux core, it causes a solenoid valve to open and gas starts to flow through the system. Here is an industrial application of gas shielded flux core. Here you see the wire feeder in the left hand uh, corner. Uh, this uh, would typically take 50 or 60 pounds of wire. Uh, somewhere in the system, uh, there is a, a line that feeds the uh, gas, uh, a shielding gas, which is carbon, uh, typically carbon dioxide, but maybe the mixtures of argon and carbon dioxide and perhaps other gases. The self-shielded version of flux cord arc welding is typically abbreviated with a dash S or perhaps dash SS for self shielded. It looks very much the same as gas shielded flux core with the absence of uh, the shielding gas. One of the nice aspects of gas, gasless flux core or self shielded flux core 
is that it can be used under windy conditions uh, without harm. If that gas shield is blown away, it's not present to do its job anymore. And so most of our field welding applications today use self-shielded flux cord arc welding. In a fabrication shop, particularly one up north where we close up the shops to protect uh, from the cold weather in the, in the wintertime, uh, gas shielded flux core uh, may be used in the shop. Uh, down south, I find a lot of the fabricators with open uh, shops where it's warm all the time uh, use the self shielded flux core even inside. Gas metal arc welding, sometimes known as MIG welding, M I G, for metal inert gas. This is a process that's not commonly used for structural steel, but it's showing up more often, and I want you to be aware of it. Gas metal arc is identical to flux cord gas shielded with one difference. Rather than having a flux cord wire, gas metal arc uses a solid wire or a metal cord wire, but there's no flux involved with the system. Now immediately that ought to tell you something about gas metal arc. Gas metal arc requires that you weld on cleaner surfaces than what we can weld on with flux core because now we no longer have the fluxing ingredients that help give us the atomic cleanliness that's required for given applications. So heavily scaled material will probably be shot blasted before it's welded with gas metal arc welding. Of course, a lot of our material doesn't have heavy scale on it. A lot of you are designing things out of tubular steel, for example, and that tubular steel often comes in and the surfaces look quite clean and gas metal arc is ideal for those applications. To the contractor doing the work, one of the advantages is that there's not the slag coating that needs to be cleaned off afterwards. If I take you to any of the automotive plants or agricultural equipment manufacturers, they use gas metal arc all the time, every day, uh, often in robotic applications because they don't need to contend with the slag. They're dealing with pretty clean material. Here's an example of a gas metal arc machine. I deliberately selected this because it's a small compact unit. Uh, this unit runs on 110 volts. Uh, there's the source of gas shielding and built into this unit is both a wire feeder and a power supply. And if you want to have a little gas metal arc set up at home or you can run these with flux core, uh, those are handy. Uh, that machine I showed you needed 220 or 230 volt input. This only needs 110, so you can use it anywhere you want. Every home should have one of those too. And um, put that on your Christmas list and get the red ones. Um, <clears throat> next process, submerged stark welding. It has nothing to do with welding underwater. Submerged stark welding gets its name because the arc is submerged under a blanket of flux. With this process, instead of having a flux on the outside of the electrode like we had with shielded metal arc, or on the inside of the electrode like we have with flux core, now we have a granular flux that's flowed down through a tube and just lays down on the plate. The arc takes place underneath that flux, and the arc acts, excuse me, the flux acts as a blanket. It limits the amount of smoke and the amount of arcing that's going to go on. Here's an example of submerged arc and the welds being made as, we, as this photograph was being taken. So unlike most of the welding processes, you don't see the uh, bright arc and you don't have the uh, smoke uh, that would be typical of the other kinds of operations. Now, of course, with this came two major uh, restrictions to the process. The first restriction is the welder is trained to watch the weld pool. That's day number one in welding school. You learn about safety and then the operator start, uh, the, the instructor instructor starts to lecture about watching the weld pool. If you're going to be a successful welder, you've got to watch the pool because you've got to control that molten pool of metal. But now we take it away. We can't see that molten pool. And so oftentimes submerged arc welding, as in this application, is mechanized. Some kind of mechanical system guides the arc. The second thing is this flux has to stay in place when the weld's molten and that restricts the position in which submerged arc can be used into the flat and the horizontal position. Here's an automatic application of submerged arc. It happened that the architect uh, who specified these columns that went into a shopping mall very much wanted a cast iron column look. 
uh, to those, was very concerned about the appearance of the wells uh, at, uh, in the shopping mall, and Submerged Ark was selected as the process for this application because it can put down some beautiful looking wells. Submerged Ark, uh, again, is typically mechanized. Here we see a bridge girder being fabricated. It's the workhorse in our bridge fabrication girder, uh, plants. And um, uh, here out ahead of the buggy, uh, you see a preheat torch in addition. It can be used in what we call the semi-automatic mode, where you have a handheld gun that the operator propels. The operator must be trained to look at different things than the pool. And uh, when you see uh, this operator, uh, of course, there's standard safety equipment like goggles and, and hard hat, but you don't see the need for uh, the heavy protective uh, leather sleeves or the, uh, uh, the uh, hood, uh, face shield that would be typical.